Well, hey guys, and welcome to the podcast. This week, I have a very special guest, uh, someone that you will know very well because he is the main man of the channel that I work on called the Producer Michael channel. So I would like to introduce you to Michael Blakey, aka Producer Michael. Hello, mate. Hey there. How are you? Good morning. I'm good. I'm good. This is uh, this is fun because you've not been, as far as I'm aware, you haven't been interviewed in this capacity for a long time, right? I don't think ever. I've got these plugs in my ears and a microphone in front of my mouth, and uh, and I'm looking into a computer and seeing myself. Yeah, I mean, it, it it at least it looks professional. I like the fact that we've got matching uh, microphones as well. If you saw my setup here, you wouldn't say it's professional. <laughs> I've got light balanced in flower vases. I've got my computer balanced on an ice bucket to get the right elevation. It's <laughs> far from professional. Hey, but as long as it looks good. Right. Yeah. No, I, I can imagine that's how it looks. I, I have seen your handiwork before. Um, so yeah, I mean, basically, mate, like I said on the phone, I, I just, I think that people will love to hear us chat candidly. Obviously, people see us on camera uh, together, but they don't get an idea of what our friendship is outside of things. And a lot of people do ask like, oh, uh, you know, are you and Michael actually friends? Heck like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always like, I, I probably see Michael's face per day and hear your voice more than my own. Because if I'm not on the phone to you, I'm editing a video of you or I'm shooting a video with you. Like, yeah, it's, um, I, I do at this point think that I've seen your face for, for more hours in my lifetime than I've seen my own. That's pretty scary when you think about it. <laughs> You're telling me. You're telling me. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, really, I just think it would be an interesting opportunity to kind of flip things around and uh, and I can ask you some questions And because obviously, you know, I know you pretty well now, uh, but there are still things that I don't know about your career and your history and kind of how you got to where you are now. So why don't we just start at the beginning? Go for it. And if yeah. you ask any offensive questions, watch me run. We'll just redact them. You'll run for that, there you go. that beautiful hill behind you. Um, okay, cool. Well, I guess, like, why don't we go all the way back? So you're English. We're both English. Um, but I know that you lived in Spain for a while. You lived in Germany for a while. And obviously, you've been in the US for a while. So where where were you born in the UK? Like, where did uh, where did you start out? I'm told somewhere in London, um, I don't know exactly where, mm -hmm. um, but uh, London, and I was in London till I was, I think, 14 or something like that. And uh, my, my parents decided to move to Spain. And of course, I tagged along. And it was wonderful. Great place to grow up. So you grew up in London, did you? For, for the most part, yeah. I was partly um, in Northern England. Um, and then I was in London. And then... Uh, from the most part I remember, I was actually in Spain. Right, got you. And what what about school and stuff? Actually, do you have brothers and sisters? Uh, I have two sisters and I didn't go to school. You didn't no, go I to school? Did. <laughs> I was going to say, we, I didn't know if you were homeschooled. Um, do you, are they your brothers and si are your sisters older than you or younger than you? They're both older than me. Right, okay, got you. So were you like treated as the, the best sort of only child because you were the, the best boy? Oh, absolutely. And I was my dad's <laughs> favorite. I, I always said that to my mum. I was like, there is no chance that you are ever having any more kids. I actually said to her, if she had a baby, then I would go and live with my grandparents because I wanted to be an only child. <laughs> like I was not sharing any of my stuff. So I guess being the youngest is good because you just get to annoy the older ones, right? You don't have to share with any younger ones after you. Well, that, that's true. And, you know, being a boy and having two sisters, I don't get to wear their clothes. Maybe my parents put me in their dresses. I don't know when I was a baby, but uh, I'd like to think not. <laughs> well, that's cool. And so so then your your young life kind of formative years were the UK. And was it was it scary moving to Spain? Like, had you got friends and stuff in, in the UK? So I had a deal with my parents that um, if I went to Spain and I missed my friends, then my parents would fly him out to see me. And that actually worked quite well because it happened a lot. That's a pretty solid deal, yeah. No, I, I, I get that. And where in Spain were you? Uh, I was in two places in Spain. One was a place called La Manga, which is on the uh, east coast of Spain, on the Costa Blanca, uh, meaning the white coast. And then I was also in Marbella, Marbella which is on the south uh, of Spain on the coast, uh, and that's on Costa del Sol, coast mm -hmm. of the sun. Most beautiful place. Highly recommend to anybody 
that uh, wants to visit Spain, go to Marbella. It's gorgeous. Yeah, I, I like Marbella. It is beautiful there. Um, the uh, where? Wait, no, I'm thinking of the wrong place. I was going to say Porta Banus, but that is yeah, that's Marbella. Oh, that it is, is oh, okay. right in the heart of Marbella. Perfect. Uh, yeah. Very, very famous port. It's like the jet set of Europe. Actually, it's Monaco of Spain, mm-hmm. and a beautiful, beautiful place. Yeah, there were some crazy boats there. Monaco as well. Like that's that's insane. I haven't spent much time in Monaco. I've been twice yeah i've been twice um and really only got to spend sort of half a day there at a time but what a beautiful place to live you can see why all the formula one drivers live there for the uh the tax purposes can't you there is no tax in monaco that's which is what, what very I mean, advantageous yeah. but if you don't live in monaco and you haven't been there for a long long time you can't actually live there and become a resident uh they keep it very privileged for their um i i don't know that the ultra elite so i'm it's, sure it's kinda, yeah. yeah well doesn't cool lewis hamilton live out there uh, rumor has it he lives there yeah rumor yeah. and there's a bunch of f1 drivers that actually live there that's mental isn't it and oh no jo- uh, john olsen i don't know if you'll know him he's a professional um st- uh, skier and he in fact he's got a crazy youtube channel his his production quality is insane on on his vlogs but uh he i thought he lived there but he doesn't he lives in marbella he's got a beautiful house in marbella um but yeah so that's cool so you moved to spain and then what did your parents move there because of work or what what made them move across there so at that time uh there was this crazy thing in in the uk that um if you made over a certain amount of money you ended up paying 98 percent of it to the british government what uh, yeah 98 percent yeah it was 98p on the pound uh totally insane and my father decided well what's the point of working there if you're just working to pay the government so consequently he said ah, i've had enough and moved to spain why Spain? I don't know, but oh, Spain. Okay. And I'm glad he did because it was a great, great uh, place to grow up. Yeah, no, no, for sure. I bet. Yeah, in the sunshine. And so what did you do there? Like as a kid, what, obviously you and later life got into your drumming and into music, but like as a kid, what did you do? What were you into? Well, the, the first thing I did was learn Spanish. Otherwise, I was kind of helpless. And um, I actually speak Spanish pretty well, very well. Um, so I, I made new friends and uh, living on the water, you kind of do a lot of water sports. So uh, I did a lot of windsurfing, um, water skiing. I wasn't that great at water skiing, but I was really good at windsurfing and uh, had some crazy disaster happen on the windsurf board, which I won't get into right now. Rip. Why Why would you say that and then not get into it? What did you do? Um, did you end up in Africa? <laughs> no, much worse than that. <laughs> um, I, I'll tell you off camera. Really? <laughs> It's that bad? Well, it's embarrassing. It's not really this well, bad. It's just a reason. Well, that's fine. We're, we're not here to make you look okay, good. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> All right, so I'll tell you. So I was really, really good at... Uh, let me just have a sip of my scotch here. Hold on one second. Okay, perfect. Here, let me have a sip out of my fancy uh, glass as well. Yeah, my, yeah mine's a, um, well, mine isn't plastic, actually. So it's kind of nice crystal. But uh, I thought it was scotch. It's actually water. And it's not going to help me at all with this story, but I'll tell you. So um, I was a young kid, and uh, uh, being in the, on the south coast of Spain, a beautiful place, the beach is spectacular. Gorgeous women laying on the beach all day long. And I used to surf with a bunch of my friends up and down the beach at high speed and do tricks on the board. And... Um, one day, uh, I, was, I was doing this trick. It was quite windy, uh, so I was going pretty fast. And I used to like to bend back and hit myself in the water on my back and spray my back. And uh, I, Anyway, I did these tricks, and, and then I hear people screaming from the beach. I thought, what the heck's happened? Anyway, long story short, what had happened was I guess I hit the water, which can be like concrete uh, at a high speed around my butt, and it ripped my trunks off. And I didn't know. <laughs> Because uh, there's water spraying <laughs> in my face from the front board. And there I am going backwards and forward, completely naked. Get out of town. You never yeah, were. I swear I was. <laughs> and then uh, and then I realized that, oh, my God. So so what I did was I jumped off the board, took the sail off the mast, wrapped it around myself, laid on the board, and kind of swam my way back <laughs> to the shore. And the interesting thing is, so being in a touristy area, uh, and again, I was a kid, so I wasn't thinking totally straight thinking that you know most people go for two weeks or a week so i didn't go back to the beach for two weeks thinking that it would be a change of people and nobody would recognize me but uh that wasn't the case because when i went back oh that's the naked boy (laughs) 
that's yeah, hilarious. That's my wind, windsurfing story. That is hilarious. Well, that's cool. It's cool that you grew up doing sports. Do you play anything else? Because I know that you're a golf. dab hand at pool, table tennis, golf. golf. I used to play golf every single day. Uh, wake up in the morning, go to the driving range, hit golf balls. Uh, my father was a really good golfer. Um, there was a point where I was thinking about being a professional golfer, and he was pushing me in that direction. I didn't want to be a professional golfer, but uh, I became pretty good at it and then completely gave it up. I haven't played golf in forever. Uh, why? Because you're, you're not far from the, uh, what is it, Beverly Hills Golf Club? Bel Air. Bel Air country, country Club, yes, just down the road. And uh, it's a gorgeous country club, but it takes so long and it's a bit boring. Um, and I'm not as good as I used to be, which will be ultra frustrating. So I guess you uh, are bl- one of the most competitive people I know. Pro- actually, no, I'm going to say you're probably the most competitive person I know. Well, it's, just, it's nice to be the best you can at something, right? It's not necessarily yeah. about winning, but always be the best you can. And if you've been better and you go downhill, it's like frustrating. So to give to give you guys listening an insight into just how competitive Michael is, we just shot a video at a house that had a pool table. And um, you won't see this in the edit, so this is a bit of behind the scenes. And you know what do I'm going to say, Do you don't have you? to? I know exactly what's coming. <laughs> I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. So we, Michael broke and, and potted one and then had two more shots. First one, you hit the ball but didn't pot it. Second one, he's like, okay, can, can I get it into that pocket? Totally spanned it. Didn't, didn't even hit the ball, did you? And then did you pot the white or did the white well, Wait, just... wait, wait, wait. It was an ultra-fine cut. Ah, ultra-fine cut, like there razor we go. blade cut. And I was a millimeter out and <laughs> consequently missed the ball. And they said to Adam chop that out the video and not but it wasn't that you just told me to chop it out when it happened there and then i because i know you so well i thought as i'm driving home from the shoot i was like i bet you he calls me up and says adam please take that out of the video i don't want that in the video the next morning i was cleaning my car i get a phone call from you and you're like um you know that bit in the video where i missed the ball can you and i was like cut it out yeah i already knew you were gonna ask me to do that i didn't i didn't sleep that night i was like petrified <laughs> it's gonna go in the video I'm like, you are hilarious. You are hilarious. So <laughs> there you go. There's a bit of a bit of insider info into what goes into or doesn't go into the videos. Um, but yeah, I mean, I get what you mean with golf. Like I, back in the UK, uh, my apartment backed onto Warwick Golf Course, well, Warwick Race Course, and there was like a little municipal, municipal course in the middle. Um, and so I used to go and play that quite a lot. And golf's one of those games where it's like, it's so rewarding when you hit that shot or you sink the putt or whatever. But for me, eight out of ten times, I just played like absolute shite, and it was so frustrating. You can't say that. That's a bad word. Oh no, you can. That's the beauty of a podcast. Oh, you can say that. Carry mm-hmm. on. Carry on. Be yeah, yourself. Yeah. yeah, you can't. <laughs> I can't f and, and bomb like that. But yeah, you can. You can do that. It's fine, mate. This we is the, we should the actually, lawless internet. Well, we should actually go and play golf and. Uh, Ooh. I could still hit the ball quite well. You'd be shocked. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'd I'd definitely be down. I would want to get a few round or a few hours in at the driving range just to get my eye back in. But yeah, I'd I'd be down for that. Maybe maybe that'd be a let's fun do it. video. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> Go and tear up Bel Air Golf Course. <laughs> How much is it for a round there? Well, you can't you can't uh, play unless you're a member. That's what. But even so, when you're a member, you have to pay, don't you? Well, you pay a monthly subscription fee. Uh, so dues. so remember uh shady canyon where we did that house with caroline the one with all the speakers yes the guy who was like the audiophile well uh, i met a lady down at the beach while i was walking diesel um the other day and she was a member of that golf course and she said that it's two even if you remember it's 200 dollars per round of golf no so what she's probably referring to is the cart fee and caddy fee so at bel-air um you pay an outrageous, and I mean outrageous, entry fee, which is non-refundable. It's right. just uh, to be able to be um, a member. Right. And then you pay monthly fee, and then you have to pay uh, a food fee, whether you eat it or you don't eat it, which is about 500 bucks a month or something. So you have to consume $500 worth of food a month. Right. Um, and then when you play, it's mandatory to take a caddy. The caddy is about 250 bucks a round. And uh, a golf cart, I think, is about a hundred bucks around. So you've got three fifty there, uh, but you're not actually paying the club to to right, pay. Got uh, you. To play but it's a of. mandatory thing that you've got to pay for. Regardless, you have to have a caddy because the caddy is the one that makes sure that you know if you're in a bunker, the sand is raked nicely and divots are re- replaced, all that stuff. Wow, 
God, that's great. Yeah. Mind you, I guess if you got enough money to uh, be a member of Bel Air Golf Course, then what's 250 bucks? It's a lot less than the membership initiation fee. Yeah, no, I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, and so, all right then. So as you as you're growing up, then you uh, you're into your water sports and part time male nude modeling. Um, what about <laughs> <laughs> what about your music? When did that come about? Well, I started playing drums when I was about eight uh, in England, maybe even younger than that, seven or eight, and uh, started taking it seriously when I was maybe nine and uh, had drum lessons twice a week practiced as much as i possibly could and it all kind of grew from there that's cool and wh- why was that you or was that me that was ktla sending yeah. a not- notification that says uh who knows what it says it's, it's about the pandemic okay uh, and on mine rick garcia has sent me a message about my reptile terrarium Oh, there you go. I'll, I'll Everybody get, should back. have a reptile terrarium. I'll get back to him later. Yeah, we upgraded you have turtles. The, no, the spider. We oh, got the um, spider. Yeah, Do we you got, need a license for that. No, no, he's just a little pink toe, a little pink toe tarantula. But he was in like a one of the square ones that was sort of taller than they are wide because tra- well, pink toe tarantulas like to climb, um, and so uh, he loved that. And I put him in like a new log and stuff, and so he climbed to the top of that. And I was like, well. If some is good, more is better, right? I mean, how many times have I said that? So I was like, why don't we get him a bigger one? So we upgraded him, and now he's got essentially like a fish tank size one with like a log in there and another little one he can hide in. He's got two put two water bottle uh, water things that we call his hot tubs, and he's now got a, a real pothos plant in there. He loves it. He has a great time. He's probably the most pampered spider you'll ever meet. What do you feed it? Uh, crickets. He eats crickets. Lovely. Lovely. Yeah. I know. Enough I, about the spider. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't eat crickets, but yeah, that's, that's what he likes. He, he said that's he doesn't. That's not what I heard. I thought you like crickets. But... No, no, unless no, they're, unless no they're vegan. Did you know that um, crickets are a really good source of protein? And there's actually companies that make ve- uh, not vegan that make cricket protein powder. Did you know that? Yes, I've seen that, and they also have cricket chips. Yeah, and apparently, and if you go to if you go to Southeast Asia, you'll see cricket cookies you'll see cricket cupcakes you'll see cricket everything yeah and apparently the uh in in terms of like the sustainability of farming crickets to make things like protein powder and stuff apparently on the um what's the word i'm looking for here i'm completely brain farting um it's much better for the environment obviously not for the crickets but it's much better for the environment to mass farm them and get protein that way than it is from like soybeans and things Really? Mm-hmm. Well, you won't find me eating crickets yeah, regardless. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm good. I'll stick some my pea protein. Thank you very much. Um, so, so yeah, all right then. Well, music, so you're into your drums, got into that, kind of played through. And then at what point did you go from windsurfing in Spain to, because I know you were then in Germany, weren't you? You, you skipped across there and got into a record studio, a, a music studio over there? Recording studio, yeah. So there's a, a very famous studio in, in Berlin called Hansa Tone Studios. Um, at least there was. I don't know if it's still there. And uh, at the time, they worked with some of the top musicians in, in Germany. Berlin being isolated with a wall around it back then meant that anybody, any top musician that was in Berlin uh, had limited choices. So they went to Hansa, and I was fortunate enough to become like the studio main stay there for drums. When was this? Like about 1941, something like that. 1922. <laughs> what? Um, I'm just trying but, to think. Were drums even invented back then? Yeah, I'm, so. sure, I'm sure. I'm sure. Cave, cavemen had them, didn't they? Yeah. Boom. 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 What? Yeah. Um, just backing up a little bit. What? Obviously, if you were playing drums, like what made you want to? If you, if your dad was sort of pushing you to be a professional golfer, like where was your career path headed? Did you have any idea growing up what you wanted to do? I wanted to be, first I wanted to be a train driver. Um, that didn't work out. Really? Then I wanted to be a pilot. That didn't work out. I kind of uh, did, just not, you're not flying other people around. That's true. Um, then I wanted to be a musician. That's all I really wanted to uh, be. And being not talented in that regard at all, uh, drums was my really only alternative. Although, to be honest, you have to be ambidextrous and you know you have to be able to separate your limbs to play drums. Oh yeah, no, for sure. I've I've had a, a little go at that. Like, what is it where you do like like 
ding, 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 ding. So you've got. You like, did that. You did that on my drums, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, there you go. That's the only thing I can do on drums. My friend George Hewell taught me how to do that when I was about twelve, and, that's and it's it. not that easy. It's not that easy. No, it's weird. That as soon as he told me that you had to cross your hands, I was like, "Wait, what? Why? That's such a weird way of playing. Why wouldn't you play this way?" And he's like, "Nope, that's not how you do it." Um, so yeah, no, I, I get that. I get that. That's difficult. And so. What? How did you move from? Were you doing any type of like professional music stuff in in Spain? Had you done any work experience, or what happened? Did you finish school? Like, let, what's that little period of your life looking like? Yeah, I did. I did all of that stuff. Um, my my big thing was uh, when when I was in Spain, I got to play with uh, Julio Iglesias. Uh, I don't know if anybody will know who he is, but he was back in the day, unbelievable singer. He was like top of the top, and. Uh, and what I do you mean play you with him. to play with him? Like what, in, in what capacity? So I, I recorded with him in, in, uh, in Madrid um, in studios. And uh, sorry, I got another a CA, CNN notification this time. Um, I got to uh, record a couple of tracks in, uh, in Madrid in the studio. And that was more luck than judgment because the drummer that was scheduled to do it uh, couldn't for some reason. And they asked me because I, I, you know, I was quite well known as a drummer back then. And then um, I went out and played and tour a couple of times. Oh no way! And then, so, I, th- then then I ran away from Spain. <laughs> so so how does it how does it work with like with getting those drumming gigs? Were you as a session drummer? Do you go on like a register so that you can get called upon? Like how how does that actually work? Well, it worked in two two ways. One, uh, there were a bunch of music competitions in Europe back then. Uh, one of which I won a couple of times, a European something of the year, whatever it was. Um, and that gets you on the map. And then on top of that, I had an agent and an agent's job is to, you know, get you as much, uh, work as possible. I wasn't really doing it for the, for the money thing. I was doing it to have the experience. And of course the money was very nice and it, and it, it took off. Got you. And were you in a band or anything? I was in lots of bands. I was never in a band where I could say I was in a band. I was the drummer in a band, right. if that makes any sense. Got you. Oh, that's cool. And so was that, was drumming for Julio Iglesias your kind of first step up on the ladder where people were like, oh, okay, this guy's legit? Um, I played with a bunch of very, very well-known uh, bands and, and singers uh, all over Europe, actually. Um, this was before none, you moved uh, to Germany? Both when I was in Germany and also when I was in Spain. Um, you know, like I said, I'd won all these different things and... Uh, I don't know why, because I, I don't think I'm a good drummer. Certainly not today. I'm very rusty. But um, <laughs> at, at the time, people liked certain things that I did, and I was, you know, a, a phone call away, so I'd, I'd go and play with all sorts of people, which was great. But what I learned from it, which I think is, you know, the, the biggest thing that helped me was production, because I didn't want to be a drummer all my life. Uh, it's it's fun to sit behind a drum kit and, and you know, bash, bash away, but... Uh, to actually create the music was what I was always about. And, and when I was in these studios, I watched all the producers and I got to see some very, very prominent, very, very successful producers who really, really knew what it was, uh, what, what it was like to make a, a hit song. So I picked up as much of that as possible and uh, tried to do it myself. Got you. And so when you moved to Germany, what, what caused that move? Uh, do I have to say? I mean... You can be as, okay. as candid so, as you like. So I, I, would I, was, like you to. I, I was in Spain and um, I, I met somebody and uh, you know, my, my parents didn't like this somebody for whatever reason. I don't, I don't know why, uh, but, but they didn't, but I did. And, you know, being a young kid and uh, like every young kid, nobody listens to their parents and <laughs> they're always right. I mean, in hindsight, you look back, the parents are always right, but n- n- nonetheless, um, I liked her apparently more than I liked my parents, and uh, I ran away. I, I ran off to Germany with this person, with this girl. Was and she German? She was German. Uh, uh, she spoke very limited English, and I spoke zero German. Uh, I had no money whatsoever. I had a $100 American bill, which was something that I'd had for like three years. I don't know where, even know where I got it from, but I had it, and uh, maybe... 20 or 30 dollars worth of spanish currency because i lived with my parents i had you know i didn't need anything i had uh, um you know access to whatever they allowed me to have access to which was what all i needed i suppose right anyway i ran away uh ended up in germany uh that's not true i also had an air ticket 
I was going to uh, say, yeah, how did how did you make it over there? Did you? Did I had, you have a, to go I had an air ticket. Right, um, got you. I, I had a little car in Spain, which I left and abandoned. And uh, there I was. Now I arrive at uh, Tegel Airport in Berlin, uh, not knowing where I'm going. Well, that's not true. I was, I was with, this, with this girl. Um, but she didn't know where she was going because what we're going to do, she lived with her parents. And I was like, what the heck are you going to do with this young 19-year-old kid? <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I end up there and they were gracious enough to put me up. Um, yeah, uh, it was difficult. <laughs> that, that sounds like and, and I'm far. I'm also far too stubborn to call my parents and say, help, I did the wrong thing, get me back. Right. Uh, that's not the character I am. You know that from me. Yeah. And uh, long story short, I, I stayed there and uh, made a career out of it, so it worked out. That's awesome. And so did you? were your parents mad with you? Did you make friends with them again? Like, how did that whole relationship spin out? Uh, about three years later... So wow, when, when, I, when I first got there, um, I, couldn't, I couldn't speak German um, and you know, I needed to make some money somehow. So my only alternative at that time, uh, Berlin was controlled by the Allied forces. So that was the Americans, the British and the French. And it was, uh, you know, a, a walled city in the middle of East Germany. So uh, my options were find somewhere where they speak English. And the only place that they spoke English was... Uh, RAF Gatow, which was a, an Air Force base, British Air Force base in Spandau, Berlin. Uh, and I became their dishwasher. <laughs> That's cool. So, yeah, because obviously I know you, you always say that you wash dishes for the British Army, but I never knew kind of how that came about. So, I'm see, I'm learning stuff from this as well. This is fun. Um, and then from there, then you, you started to explore the music thing. Because obviously, I guess that being a, a or somewhat lucrative skill set, you'd be silly not to try and make the most of that, right? Or was there always the hope that Berlin would be a good spot for music? Well, I actually turned my dishwashing into a business. So they had about uh, 20 dishwashers. Um, literally, they were washing dishes in the office's mess. And, you know, you, when you've got, you know, thousands of, of army people and Air Force people, uh, th that creates lots of dishes. And uh, mm -hmm. it, it was terrible. It was a terrible time. However, um, I noticed after maybe four or five days doing this that the dishwashers didn't last very long and, uh, you know, they, they, they just left or didn't show up because it's, it's not a pleasant environment really and the pay was not great, obviously, as you can imagine. So I thought, well, what if I were to bring in the people to do this um, and, and, you know, I would be in control of them. So I spoke to the officer that was in charge of the mess, uh, mess meaning officer's mess yeah. where they where they eat. Um, and it was a mess because I, one of my jobs was to clean it. But um, w w what I did was I asked permission to, for him to give me a couple of weeks for me to recruit some people. And uh, I would be in control of it. He says, yeah, sure, why not? So as long as the dishes got done in the period where there weren't people while I was recruiting them, he didn't care how it, how it worked. Right. So I went down to the uh, Arbeitsplatz, which is a work, workplace where people go for, um, you know, to, to get jobs. And they had a lot of what they call guest, guest Arbeiters, which are foreigners that come into the country that also don't speak German, uh, all looking for, for jobs, predominantly from, from Turkey and from other, other um, countries where, you know, Germany had, the, um, had them open where they could come in and work. So I went down there and I recruited about 30 different people, 30 people, and uh, I was now responsible to pay them with the money that I received from the, um, from the British Army to do this. I was a civilian. And of course, I made a little bit of money on each person and I turned it into a business. And that then grew into a landscaping business because it was on hundreds of acres. I mean, there was an you know, airport there. So that, that was my first really entrepreneurial effort. And that worked out well. At that point, I didn't have to do the dishes myself anymore, and I could concentrate on music, and I kept that going for quite a period of time. And so it ended up being that the the army was paying them, say, one, I guess it was francs back there, wasn't it? Like one franc per hour you would take. No, francs, francs uh, are in France. Yeah, this Deutsch was marks. Do Deutsch marks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you would, you would, what, take a, a little cut off the top and, and just give them the, the 80% and you would keep 20 um, I don't think I was quite that greedy. It was, let's say, it was four marks would you, would you an consider, hour. Would you consider that to be quite a greedy uh, percentage split then? 
Uh, it depends on the level <laughs> of uh, what you're putting in there. I, I think sometimes 50-50 is not even fair. <laughs> should, we, should we have that conversation off camera, Michael? I think, I think we should, yeah. I think we should. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, I, I, I think, you know, what, what I did was um, I, I created a little business from nothing, absolutely from nothing. And um, I, I had initially like 30 people, then it became 40, 50, 60. And, and it, it worked out for everybody. Everybody was happy. And uh, I was happy and I could concentrate on the things I was very passionate about. That's awesome. And so then how did you get into the music then? Like what, what was the, the initial step in making it towards being, what, who were you the drummer for? Uh, Tears for Fears? Uh, no, I, I, was, I was the drummer for probably 30 different bands that you would know all their names. But right. I, that's what I was. I was a drummer in a studio. I wasn't the drummer yeah, that was so you part on of tour. the band. So you know, I, I I played with or played for so many so many uh, bands and and groups. I, I don't ever want to say I was the drummer for anybody because I yeah, really wasn't. For sure, no, no, that makes sense. That that's cool though, and and that because I remember you saying in the last video we did with Mark where you saved up your money and you bought yourself a Rolex, and that was when you were starting to make waves within uh, that um, recording studio that you were working at, right? Yeah. So so what I did really, um, you know, now that. I had an income and I cleaned myself up and you know, very presentable. I, I went and uh, introduced myself at the studio. They knew who I was. Um, you know, it's a sm entertainment industry is very small. Uh, and back then there weren't, you know, the internet wasn't available um, and, uh, you, you know, word travels quickly amongst studios. Uh, so they said, yeah, come, come play for us. And uh, I did. And, and, you know, they kept me and then I had a, a firm position and the money was decent. And then I wanted to get out of playing drums and start producing after I saw how people were doing that. And uh, that's how I became a producer. And was that at that studio? My first record I ever produced uh, was actually done in somebody's bedroom uh, with very, very primitive equipment. And uh, it, it did really, really well. It was nominated for a Grammy. Uh, I'm not going to tell you this song because I don't know if the artist would want to know that it was recorded in a bedroom. <laughs> Surely that um, doesn't matter now. Yeah, I just don't want to do it. I don't. I don't, I don't want to say it because you know I, I don't know how they would feel about it. Okay. But it was it was it, um, you know more luck than judgment. It was my first attempt at it, and I don't want to say that I did a fantastic job. The record label did a fantastic job promoting it, which is why it was so successful. But now that it was nominated, guess what? My phone never stops ringing. Right, got you. That's awesome. And and so. How long were you in Germany for doing that before? Did you move from Germany to the US, right? I went from Germany to the UK and then to the US. I've had lots of different oh, of course. Uh, business ventures and stuff in between. So the UK, what talk us through that. What was going on in the UK? Because I know that you had a share in Maserati at some point. Is that right? Yeah, so, so um, what happened there... Um, I've always been into cars. I, lo I love cars. Uh, even in Germany, uh, you know, once I started to be successful, I, I had some nice cars. Uh, came back to England. Needless to say, the thing with the, with the girl didn't work out too well. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I came back to the UK. And then I continued music, but not really passionately. It was more uh, hobby than, than anything. Uh, and I got back into cars and... Uh, I had a, a, a car dealership selling used uh, exotic cars. Uh, it was really, really nicely done, a beautiful showroom. And I was approached by uh, one of the representatives from Maserati to see if uh, you know, I wanted to take on uh, a dealership, a Maserati dealership in that building. And I had no idea about Maserati other than uh, rumors had it that they were not the greatest cars in the world. <laughs> right. So it was an opportunity for me to go to Italy, check out the factory, uh, again, I was still a young kid. I was at 25 or 26 at the time. And uh, I, I went out there, uh, met with all the powers that be. I'm not going to bore you with the entire story because, you know, it, it's like two days long. But uh, I'll tell you another time. It's kind of funny. Uh, long story short, I didn't take a, a dealership, but I did end up owning a piece of uh, the distribution business of Maserati. Oh, very cool. And so your your car dealership then, where did that come from? Like how... How did you come up with that idea? Because I've always loved cars and, and uh, I, I thought to myself, you know, why not uh, have a selection to drive and simultaneously, you know, sell them? 
Right. So, uh, I, so I did that. And... So at one point, Michael Blakey was a used car salesman. Oh, that's awful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <I'm>, I guess. <laughs> that's that's awesome. Though. I I didn't know that. I knew I. I think I, I wasn't that. actually a salesman. I actually never sold a car. I had people that were <laughs> versed in that, that knew what they were doing. Um, I did actually sell one car. That's I did sell one car, and so. I messed that up on monumental <laughs> scales. But that turned out to be one of the best moves I ever made as well. Why was that? God, it's a, it's a boring story. Do you want to hear it? Yeah, of course. We got. Hey, this is the beauty so, of a podcast. We've got time. Okay, so uh, one morning I go to the dealership, um, and bearing in mind this was, what was it, 86, 87, somewhere around there, um, and there was no computers, everything was done manually. I go, I go there, um, and I wasn't there very often, maybe once or twice a month, just to see what was in the showroom, and you know if I could grab something to drive and have some fun with. Uh, anyway, I go there. It was may- maybe 7, 7.15 in the morning. And the showroom actually opened about 9.30, I think it was. Anyway, I, I-, I go in. Uh, obviously, I've got a key. I'm by myself, and I'm looking at the cars, and really, really nice cars. Uh, there was like four or five 911s on the showroom floor. Two of them were black ones. Uh, I'll never forget this. And uh, anyway, this-, this guy comes to the to the door. It's all glass. The showroom's all glass, obviously. And he knocks on it because the door's closed, and... I open the door and I say, sorry, it's closed. He said, well, can I come and look at the cars? I say, yeah, sure, why not? So he comes in and he's looking at the cars and he walks up to this, this black 911, one of two, and he said, uh, how much is this car? I said, you know, I, I have no idea. So I said, you know, I, I don't work here. I, I didn't tell him, you know, I own the place. I, I just said, I, I have no idea. Uh, I said, well, can you find out? So I said, okay. So I go into the general sales manager's office and on the wall there was a... Um, uh, I don't know what you'd call it. It's a plastic thing with cards in it. Mm-hmm. And all the cars were listed on these cards. So uh, I, I, I see this black 911 and I lift it up and it has the the, uh, the, the sales price. And I, I'm, I'm guessing, I, I'm guess, I think it was like 40,000 pounds or something like that. Right. I might be miles out with the number, but let's, let's call it 40,000 pounds. So I go back out and I said... Uh, the cars, no, actually, sorry, I beg your pardon. I think it was like 20,000 um, pounds. So uh, I, I go back out and I said to the guy, it's 20,000 pounds. And he said, 20,000 pounds? I said, yes. He said, uh, I'll take it. I said, I said okay. Um, but I, I, I don't know how to do the paperwork. I don't know anything. You have to come back at about 9.30. Bearing in mind, it was about 7.30 in the morning. Right. And he said, uh, Okay, uh, but I, I need to know I've got a deal. Can we sign something? I said, no, you, you know, you've got a deal. Uh, I shake hands with you. you, you you've got a deal. So he says, okay, I'll, I'll come back at 9.30 in the morning and I'll bring a, what they call a bank draft, which mm-hmm. is the same as a cashier's check. It's a guaranteed funds from the bank. Okay, great. So he didn't ask me for discount, didn't ask for anything. And he leaves. About an hour later, I'm still there. And uh, I had to be there because I had to tell th- this guy's name was Michael Curry at the time, the general sales manager. Um, I-, I wanted to tell him I had to sell the car. I was all proud, you know, I sold the car. So he, Michael Curry arrives, it was about quarter to nine. And I said, uh, you're not going to believe this. I just sold that car. And I point to the car. I said, oh, that's awesome. How much did you get for it? So I said, I got 20 grand for it. He said, oh, well done. It cost us 33. <laughs> so, oh, no. Had you yeah. looked at the wrong price tag? I looked at the wrong 911. <laughs> So one was like four years older than the other one. Anyway, I completely screwed up. And I guess that's why the guy said, I'll take it. Because he knew exactly what he was looking of at. Of course. No so uh, did you get your money? Michael or- said to me, you have to. Well, he, he said to me, you, you've got to get out of this. I said, I, I shook the guy's hand. How can I, how can I do that? So come, come about nine ten, this guy arrives back. Uh, I guess he'd been to the bank and he must have been waiting at the door because it took him literally five minutes to get the, the sure the, i bet he was excited to get, to get his half price porsche so so we come so he comes in and he says um i said oh, i've got your money and, and i said to him uh i i made a mistake i made a mistake with the price and he said i knew you were going to say that i said well i'm just telling you the truth i said you're going to buy the car you should i shook hands on it and uh, we're losing money but i did make a mistake and i was hoping he was going to say oh, i'll give you some more mm-hmm. he didn't so I sold him the car. He, he, he drives away the car. The guy turns out to be the editor of the newspaper. Back then it was all newspapers. 
um, the major newspaper and front page of the newspaper. I've still got the article um, somewhere. Uh, there is honesty in the used car dealing, dealer world or something like that. And they did this massive, massive review on uh, honesty in the, in the car world. And I guess I couldn't have bought that for the amount of money I lost. But it just goes right. to show if you, if you keep your word and you do what you say you're going to do, great things can happen yeah for that was, sure i was lucky though i guess and Un- under promise and over deliver right or under right. value and <laughs> yeah but, i mean you give somebody your word you gotta you gotta do it wow that's uh that's interesting so how long did that business last <laughs> um quite a while actually i sold it um and it, for, it, it, for market it, it, value it, or did you give them 20 percent off no 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 discount on that one <laughs> Um, and then, and then what? Where, where did you? Why did you end up in the U.S.? Um, still, I, I, again, music because I'd got back into music, and uh, music had always been my passion. But I wanted to create music rather than play drums. Uh, I, I haven't really played drums on anything for a long, 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 long time. Very rusty. Uh, have drums in my house. Um, you know, you've played them. Yeah. And. Uh, you know, to me, going in the studio and, and making it was always more fun. And then I got out of that and, the, you know, back in, I think it was like 2002, 2003, uh, the, the music industry kind of collapsed and it was a completely different dynamic. So I got into television and film. Uh, film didn't work so well. Uh, very difficult to make a success in the film world. But TV is, is huge and uh, uh, that's kind of what I do now. But didn't you have a... a- uh, some technology that you were a part of and then a, a record label that you sold to a pretty big company yeah how do you know about the technology that, i never told you that yeah you did you, you did no you i'll tell you when you said it you mentioned it to someone when we were doing a house tour and that was the first time i'd heard about it where you were able to strip vocals from a backing track or something that's correct yeah yeah from a mono track yeah so um it was it was a technology that uh, allowed the extraction of a vocal from a mono track. Mono track meaning there's just one track instead mm-hmm. of multiple tracks where you can isolate. Uh, in the olden days, they it could only record in in, in mono, which are, I guess the 40s and 50s. And uh, I, I didn't do it myself. I had it created. I was going to say well, as soon as I heard about that, I was like, I know for a fact that you did not come up with that technology because I've seen you try to unlock the door of your Rolls Royce. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, I certainly did not come up with the technology, but but I I own it. It's it's you know. And I where, had it developed. When was that? Was that before or after you had your own record label? That was before. Um, I was able to create um, some duet records with deceased artists, and uh, the technology has oh, been oh. used, you know, by by many producers now. Oh, and, and uh, is yeah. it still it's still technology that's being used? Do you have a patent? Yeah, on it? yeah. Yes, I say, yeah, I do. Um, oh, that's nice. And it, yes, uh, it, it's it, what it does is it, on old tapes, it gets magnetic impulses. I'm, I'm, I'm out of my league here. I don't know what I'm talking about. It somehow recognizes certain frequencies, vocal frequencies, and that allows you to pull that vocal off a track. Um, I'll give you an example. So, forensic uh, investigation sometimes. Uh, in the olden days, they used to have tapes and answer machines. You didn't have voicemail. You actually had a machine mm-hmm. with a little tape in it. Yeah. And if somebody was in under investigation, the authorities were able to use a very similar technology. If somebody erased the tape to go back by placing magna- magnetic oh. ma- magnetic magnetic <laughs> magnetic particles um in certain orders or how they were deleted to retrieve the original message and it's a very similar type of thing oh I interesting think. that's yeah. cool and and then from there you started 2k sounds yeah that was a a record label one of the first uh record labels that had music on the internet it was the infancy of music on the on the internet and uh, it did really well we developed a couple of uh, artists based on finding them on the internet uh, through various challenges and what have you, and then uh, we partnered with a, a a very large record label, of which I was then made the president of it. So that was pretty cool. I've seen those business cards. Are you, are yes, you, you able have. to share who that is, or are you? Is that something you want to keep shtum? Um, no, it's fine. I it was uh, it was Virgin Records. Um, 
uh, we did a we did a deal with them, and uh, I became the president of the music division of Two K Sounds Virgin Records. Very cool. That's awesome. Yeah. And and that is, if I'm not mistaken, that's kind of the the big one. That was one of your biggest successes, right? It wasn't a small one. I mean, uh, it was very pleasant at the time. I know it wasn't a small one because you told me what you bought to celebrate selling that company. Keep that to yourself. Really? Is that? Yeah. You, we can't, you can't share that because that story is epic. No, we'll, we'll save that for another day. Go on, tell him. I put lots of things. I don't even know what you're talking the, about. The, the, hey, I'll say it really quietly. The boat. That thing that, that made me very ill. <laughs> Please tell that story. Uh, okay. I told you, so, if you came on this podcast, we would talk about stuff. Okay, so I, I'm kind of impulsive. Um, if, I, if I see something and I like it uh, and, and able to get it, I, I do. Um, I, I've had boats all my life, uh, small boats, um, 30 footers, 35 footers. I once ventured to, I think it was a 49 footer, which was a huge boat, but uh, I had them uh, in areas where you didn't really feel waves and they were fast boats. So, you know, it's fun bouncing on the water, but I figured, well, now I've just, you know, got a, a couple of dollars to, to, Spare. I could buy just, myself something just a really just wild. a couple to rub together. Well, I bu- I bought this this big uh, mega yacht, and I'd never been on a mega yacht, and uh, haven't been on one since. Um, there's a reason for that. So, uh, I I, uh, I took delivery of this boat in Fort Lauderdale, um, and I was going to go on a world cruise and going to go everywhere in the, in this boat, and I had a, a great crew a very good crew um had some friends and uh, we took the boat out in the water i was out about an hour and a half and, and i gotta tell you i've never felt so ill in all my life it was just unbelievable and i was like to the captain get this thing back to shore i mean get it back now and I, it was so bad i wanted someone to come with a helicopter and pick me up i couldn't i couldn't stand it <laughs> did it have a helipad it did have a helipad. Oh yeah, had, it did have a helipad, but of I, course it did. It was I didn't Michael Blakey's get a, boat. Why wouldn't it have a helipad? I, I did. It had a swimming pool too, or kind of like a tub. Anyway, um, and it had a garage. It had uh, all sorts of toys in the garage. But beyond that, so so I, I, I went in on the boat back to the port. I didn't get airlifted, um, and it was the most miserable ride of my life. And it sat there. Uh, for about a year and a half, basically, with a for sale sign on it. It actually didn't have a for sale sign, but I put it immediately with a boat brokerage, sell this thing. And, uh, yeah, it cost me a fortune. So then, so then you just used it as like a party. But did you live on it, or you already had a house? I, ha- I had a house, uh, but I spayed, spayed, spent many a night on the boat. It was a fantastic party I'm sure. uh, vessel, and uh, that's all it did. It never set sail again in my ownership. That's so funny. Yeah, when you told me that, I was like, yep, that sounds like a Michael Blakey story. Horrible. That, Horrible. So, and up to that point, because you had just been on smaller boats, you were like, well, a big boat's going to be way better in the open ocean. It's completely different. It's a very slow mm. roll. It goes that way and this way. And this was um, before so. the days when they had all of the like the satellite positioning and like anti-roll stuff, I presume. Well, it still had it had stabilizers and and all the things that these these big boats have. I mean, we're not talking about the olden days here. This was in the early two thousands, and uh, it, it was a very sophisticated boat. But there's nothing you can do with anything floating in the ocean. You can take you know the biggest you know liners that there are, and they'll make you sick. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's that's hilarious. I can't believe it you... wasn't hilarious. It was a very expensive <laughs> lesson, and the lesson I learned from that is know what you're doing before you do it. And uh, yeah. And the second lesson is what's better than owning a boat? Have a friend that owns a boat. Yeah, the happiest two days of your life is the day you buy it and the day you sell it. Right? <laughs> and um, talking of boats, uh, tell everybody about the time that you went out in a cigarette boat and didn't come back in it. Well, it, it uh, that was before this and. Uh, Cigarette boats are a lot of fun, a lot of fun, very loud. 
and uh, I let, and I was very good with a cigarette, but I didn't get sick on that at all because it's it's fast. You know, yeah. So 40, in case in case people don't know what a cigarette boat is, it's basically like a very long speed boat with hoofing great big engines on the back, uh, big V eights, and they make like th- some of them make thousands of horsepower, don't they? They're insane. They do, and, and also they have straight through exhaust, so they're incredibly loud, incredibly loud. They sound amazing. You, they sound amazing when you're in the boat because you only get a bit of it. If you're away from, outside of the boat, they're so obnoxiously loud, they're horrible. Well, they're crazy. But, there's, uh, there's one in uh, Newport Harbor just down the road here, and he like puts out and it's pop, 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 all the way out. He gets out onto the ocean, and he goes quite a way out, and you hear him open up the taps, and even from the beach, which is at this point probably a half a mile, three quarters of a mile away, you still hear, and it's so loud. And I just can't it imagine. It really is loud. Yeah, it's very, how, very loud. how it sounds. I've never been on one. I really want to go on one. They're a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, they have stand-up bolsters. You don't actually sit in it. It's a stand-up bolster. Um, and I made the mistake of, I was pretty good with it. I mean, to be fair, I was pretty good coming from a non-boat person. Um, I, I, I had a friend on the boat. There were two other people on the boat with me and I had a friend. He wanted to drive it. And I said, yeah, sure, but let me show you exactly what you need to do. These boats, when they hit a wave, they actually bounce out of the water, uh, and then they come back, and then they bounce out of the water. The, the trick about um, – the, 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 well, it's not a trick. It's a necessity. When you come out of the water, you have to pull the power back on the engine so that, that, that they're, they don't overheat. The, they keep cool by getting the water through um, the, some induction – when when the the engines are in the water but the moment it comes out you've got to pull the engines back otherwise they're revving in the air and they're spinning in the air very very important this was a twin engine twin screw boat and i showed him like a bunch of times you pull the the throttles back uh the moment it comes out of the water and as soon as it hits the water you throttle forward and you have the trim tab set accordingly so that the boat balances out anyway i showed him this stuff uh all was going well and we took this one big leap out of the water and he pulled the throttles back and when it hit the water, he pushed forward, but he only somehow pushed one throttle forward, oh, which skewed the boat on its side. Literally, it lifted up. It threw us out. We weren't wearing seatbelts. Fortunately, if we right, had been yeah. wearing seatbelts, we'd have been dead. Uh, it threw us out of the boat. The boat landed on its side. This was an unsinkable boat, supposedly, which sank in about four seconds. <laughs> um, we were all thrown out of the boat. We were in life jackets. Um, and the boat just went glug, 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 and that's where it left. It rests in peace in the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. Oh, my God. And where, where was the that? The lesson learned is Michael should stay away from boats. <laughs> yeah, I think so. What, um, what area was that? Was that Florida, you said? It was Florida. It was the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, it was actually clear water Florida, which so, is on the west coast of Florida. So how long were you in the water for? How long did it take them to rescue you? about five not even five minutes three minutes there was a, a bunch of boats around it, yeah. you know it, it was not that far off the shore um it's not a boat that didn't get noticed or heard right. so right, it, was, sure. it was very quick because uh, yeah i mean there, there are a ton of sharks in those waters like big hammerheads and big tiger sharks i know that now <laughs> i got a mate who goes fishing out there every year and he's shown me pictures of so they don't they don't intentionally go out to catch sharks they go deep sea fishing but he's shown me pictures of some of the the sharks that they've caught by accident and it's terrifying and and also the places where he's caught them he's shown me on the map and it's like not even a quarter mile from like this packed beach full of families and stuff it's, well, it's t- Tampa Bay uh, apparently has one of the largest concentrations of sharks uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. Now, I don't know that uh, to be fact. That's what I've right. uh, been told and understand. There's a lot of sharks there. Yeah, and I mean, I'm I'm not saying that I'm scared of sharks being in the water in terms of like it's that's their habitat. That's where they should be. We we're the ones that shouldn't be in their zone. But um, yeah, it, it's definitely a, a pretty terrifying thing to think you could be paddling around and have one of those big beasts swimming near you. But um, that that's like here though. I mean, you know that I dive out here all the time, and in between here and Catalina is where all of the um, great whites come to have their baby great whites, and then the big ones sod off up north and the little baby ones kick around between uh palos verdes and catalina island and so you see back when i lived up in hermosa and redondo you would see like 
baby great white sharks and baby great white sharks are still eight to ten feet long and they still have mouths big enough to take one of your legs off and they'd just be like swimming around by the pier and that's where i used to go swim and well i wouldn't say surf but i would try to surf uh and then like diving around by pv and down here so it's yeah it's, it's funny growing up in england and going surfing in Newquay, where the worst thing that you're gonna try and get onto your leg is a shopping bag you or know, a tadpole. Yeah, tadpole exactly. Right exactly yeah. It's uh, it's it's very different out here when you you dive in and you're thinking, well, I may see a great white. Like when I go out to Catalina and dive out there, they they love it out there. Those kelp well, forests. That's that's where talking they like. about talking about the difference between England and the US. Uh, you talk about animals. So growing up in England, I never had to think about skunks, raccoons. Uh, mountain lions, grizzly bears, or whatever brown bears look around. I mean, we had magpies, and what, what <laughs> else did we have? Squirrels. Maybe a badger every now and again. Yeah, a, a snake was something that was unheard of. If you told somebody that you saw a snake, they wouldn't believe you. Is that oh, right, yeah. Adam? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I, I mean, the, when I first realized it was when I was gardening uh, at my place in Redondo, and I was moving this log pile uh, that had been there from the, the owner that, that owned it before, or that um, lived there before. And so I was lifting up these logs, and as I'm lifting them up, there was a, a spider's web. I was like, oh, and I kind of pulled it back. And as I pulled the, the log back, I see this black widow just like chilling in the in the the logs and i was like oh my god i totally brain farted on that that yeah there are black widows out here and i had to tell the the landlord and he had to send someone to come down because yeah they they literally have to spray for them like my my friend who lives up in bakersfield he because he's got a load of dogs he has a guy that comes out to spray for black widows and things all the time because otherwise you know if you get bitten by one of those it's it's not a good afternoon I know, and the Black Widow is something you, you would literally only see in a zoo in Europe. I yeah. mean, this is unheard of. I mean, Absolutely what? Absolutely unheard of. I've had, have... I've had a scorpion in my house. A scorpion <laughs> in my house. That's terrifying. That, terrifying. Well, I mean, up, up by you, up in the hills, I mean, you can see him behind you out the window. Like, there, are, uh, there was that mountain lion that was just killed crossing the 405 freeway, which was really sad because I, I think mountain lions are absolutely beautiful but apparently uh they think that the mountain lion was being chased by another one and it got chased across the 405 because they have trackers on them and they didn't have any tracking info for what was chasing it but it when they looked at the path it took it didn't make any sense it didn't follow any of the like the the paths that it usually did and it ended up running across 405 and getting killed but yeah i mean you know you've got little dogs and you could have them playing outside for a bit and then all of a sudden home you get a panther come and take them out yeah coyotes or all these other creatures that we are unfamiliar with back in in europe yeah interesting right? no i mean it is what what's the most dangerous thing we have in there are there are adders in the uk there are adders uh i've never seen one i've i've been around like the the woods and outdoors all my life lived in the countryside growing up and i've never seen one but i think an adder can bite you and that's it it just kind of hurts because you've been bitten by a snake there's no they're not venomous or anything um i'll tell you what i always wanted to find but i never did and i don't know if you've ever seen one it's called a slow worm have you ever heard of one of those no i've never heard of a slow worm but i thought all worms were slow i i think yeah i don't think they're the speediest um here let me show you what a slow like saying worm. a slow toad there's no real <laughs> fast ones so this is a not toad turtle 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 i guess it, toads can move this is a slow worm. There you go. If I keep talking, you should be able to see it. Wait, it looks like focus. an earthworm. Yeah, I mean, this this right here is a... So it's not a snake. That is a lizard that doesn't have legs. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's interesting. And apparently you get them like in wood piles and stuff in England. I, If I'd seen one of those as a kid, I would have wanted it as a pet. I think they're awesome. Well, I would have wanted or still want... A hedgehog. Mm. I like hedgehogs. You can't keep them as pets. You're not allowed to keep them as pets. What, says who? In the States, you can't. You can oh. in England. Oh, really? Because I've seen yeah. those little albino ones that people have, and they put them in, in the sink because they like having baths, and they kind of curl up into a little ball, lay on their back, and then they just float like this. Just In a bath? Yeah. They, yeah, like, in... they like that? How do you know they like that? Stand by, stand by. I'm going to find by. it. Because they, they say, they're like, oh, I love this bath. Um I mean, I don't even know what my own password is. 
Hold on. All right, let me find it. So um, it won't recognize you, the facial recognition, because it appears you have very large ears right now. <laughs> uh, so what am I looking for? Albino hedgehog, hedgehog in Albino hedgehog. sync. Here he is. Ready? You said you said bathtub. No, I said he's having a bath in the sink. Oh, oh, my apologies. So here's a picture. Here is a picture of one getting a. Uh, just a shower. Now he doesn't. Granted, he doesn't look like he's enjoying it all that much. But, <laughs> he's but, cute. But I mean, look at this little guy. Who would not want that as their pet? What a little cute. Look at these. Look at them. Do they? Do they make good pets? Is the question. Yeah. Apparently, when they're when they're t- uh, when they're tame, like here you go. Here's one. Here's one being given a little scrub. Um, so when they're tame, they lay all of their bristles flat. And they're just like, just just a regular, it's like a mouse. Like, they, they just do their thing and, yeah, they're and awesome. And when they're not tame, they put their bristles up and it's like a nail bed. Right? Yeah. Or a bed of nails. Yeah, exactly. They, they just, yeah, they just kind of like put all their stuff out and then they're, they're not as easy to pick up. But, I mean, as a kid, well, not even as a kid, like living in England, you would come home, especially in the autumn time, you'd come home at night or I'd be walking the dog at night and he'd be sniffing in a bush and then a little hedgehog would be in there or would be like walking across the road. I've I've saved so many hedgehogs from the road where they've been like in the gutter or something where a car's gone by and they've freaked out. And so you, you can pick them up. You just got to be very careful and, and do them like with your whole hand so you spread out the weight. Um, but yeah, they're cool. I, I think uh, uh, another thing about the UK or Europe versus the US things that we have to consider now here in the US, but you wouldn't in Europe is rabies. In the US, I would never dream of picking up one of these animals because they have rabies. Yeah. Uh, in the UK, there's no rabies, zero. No, no, exactly. Yeah, that that's it. I I think I was where was I? Oh, coming back down Route One on a road trip and me and Katie were, were driving back. It was right before the, the lockdown started or right as the lockdown started. And there was this little squirrel um, at the side of the road and he was just chewing on some stuff. So I pulled out a little piece of grass and like held it out to him. Cause in England, the squirrels come up to you and they're friendly and whatever. And as I'm holding it out, Katie's like, don't let him bite you. And I was like, well, I didn't intend on it, but okay. She's like, yeah, cause you know, they've got rabies. And I was like, Oh yeah, rabies is a thing over here, and obviously not all of them do, but you just got to be careful not to get one that that does. I think very few of them ha- actually have rabies, but it's certainly not something that you want to. Yeah, you don't want to roll yeah. those. Don't want to roll no. the rabies dice. No. Um, no. So, all right, get, getting off albino hedgehogs in bathtubs. Then, um, so music career kind of done. Now you're in the uh, the entertainment space. Obviously, you're a a, a what's the word I'm looking for. Uh, talent manager that's how we met so uh, if for people that don't know how me and michael met i still get questions and i'm like have you not seen like one of the eight videos we've done where we've talked about it but um the way that that michael and i met was uh i was over here uh, on a three-month stint seeing if i would be able to legitimately move out and move my photography business from the uk to the u.s uh, I was out on a photo, on a not a photo shoot. I was out on a drive one Sunday morning, and Michael and I have mutual friends. Michael was also on the drive. I was taking pictures of people's cars up in Malibu, and I think you just came up to me and started chatting and asked me what I was doing, and I explained, and you invited me to come to uh, to your office because you may be able to introduce me to someone that could help or whatever. And forty five minutes later, I'm leaving your office, and you're now my my manager. Yeah, well, why the heck did I do that? <laughs> Isn't it funny, though, to think that it started out as you being my manager for my photography, and if we had, if someone had said to us back then, you realized that in two years' time, three, just under three years' time, you're going to have a YouTube channel together with a million subscribers. Like, we'd be like, what? How? Yeah, no way in heaven, right? Uh, yeah. Like, how, how is that even possible? That uh, and it was entirely your your fault, Adam, that this <laughs> happened because I'd never dreamed of having a YouTube channel. And I remember you saying to me, "Oh, let's film some YouTube videos." And, and my words to you were, "Who the heck's going to want to watch that?" Right? Yeah. And, no, uh, I remember yeah. it very well. I remember being in your office, and I was like, "Well, y- you've got the following because you already had a huge Instagram following." So I was like, "Well, those people, for starters, that I think at the time you were on like two hundred thousand or something." Um, so I was like, well, that seems like a pretty good start. 
And yeah, here we are. We started in 2017, I believe, September 2017. Is that when it was? I think so, yeah. I remember it being in Monterey, the mm -hmm. first one we, we ever did. Well, actually, I and think it was think October, because Car Week is the end of September, so I think we released the video in the beginning of October. I think that's about right, yeah. And uh, I think we were hoping to get, what was it, 1,000 views? We, we would have both considered it I think, yeah, incredibly I, successful I if we got 1,000 so. views. And what did we do on the first video? Like 50,000, 40, 30,000? Uh I don't know. I don't know. I mean, looking back now, obviously, it's a lot more than that because people have gone right. back and watched it. But I, I think back then, maybe twenty five, thirty thousand. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, cause I remember. I remember the first day. I think we we smashed through ten thousand in the first day, and I was like, "Whoa, this is way bigger than I thought it was going to be." Yeah. How did that even happen? Yeah. It, I mean, it, it's awesome. I think where we really took off was when we did the the four and a half million dollar diamond bracelet that that's where we saw i think that was our first viral video that went over a million wasn't it yes that one's up about seven and a half million right now i think that's nuts and then now I know, crazy like, we we have these conversations all the time when we're watching the the stats of the videos after we post them um with you know the, the kind of views that we expect and if a video isn't doing what we expected or if a video isn't doing as well as the week before we're like booing and crying over a, a quarter of a million views and then we both have to sense check ourselves and be like wait a minute that's nuts like that is crazy we're, we're like oh we thought this would get over a quarter of a million views quicker than a day <laughs> Like that's yeah, I know, so I, I, many people. I know the one w that we just put up like three days ago. Uh, we had the conversation. I think it was yesterday. Why is it not doing so well? It's already at like, well, it, now it's at three hundred fifty thousand or thereabouts. But uh, yesterday, I think it was like two hundred eighty thousand. What went wrong? <laughs> right. it, there's nothing wrong with that. It's doing fantastic. Yeah, it's yeah, it is. It's wild. It, it's it's funny how quickly you lose perspective of of numbers because you just look at. You just look at the numbers, right? You don't actually think about what that represents. Like, imagine if you were to get every single one of those 280,000 people and fill a football stadium with them. Like, you wouldn't be able to. How many football stadiums would you need? Uh, a lot. I mean, 280,000 is like a small city. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah. It's, it's a lot. And, and then, you, then you look at the minutes of watch time. It's in the millions, like four or five million minutes of watch time. Some of them have got 50 million minutes more. It's like, my goodness, you know. It is crazy. And yeah, I mean. But like, I have to say something. I have to say something. Yeah. Um, I just show up and, and my mug's on, on the camera, but Adam does all the hard work and uh, I'm very grateful for that. Oh, I appreciate that, mate. No, it's it's teamwork. It's it's good. I, I'm, I, I think it's like the perfect storm because of, you know, your, you on camera and everything that you're able to bring uh, or bring us along to, you know, everything you have access to. And then obviously I'm able to make it look pretty on the computer and wrangle a camera. Like, yeah. And then there's something else. So we put a video out every Tuesday morning and uh, Adam can pretty much count on a call on Saturday and Sunday saying, well, did you do this to the video? Did you do this? Is this ready? And blah, blah. <laughs> for, for real, like Michael and I speak, I would say if you had to average it out, I would say that you call me at least three times a day. Uh, between three and five times a day that's probably true and you call me like once a week <laughs> yeah. I, I was gonna say I, I don't think i have to because i'm like oh i need to talk to michael about something never mind he'll call me at three like he's, he's overdue <laughs> but, that's uh, true. but no it, it works great and and i think that's that's the the best thing for me is that it's not work you know what i mean like it, it isn't a it doesn't feel like a job I, I i remember in the beginning i didn't used to like editing and i didn't used to like having to sit down and, and it's because it took me so long because i i literally before we started the producer michael channel i think i'd probably only edited no word of a lie i'd edited less than 15 full videos well yeah i i would say that's probably about right um in fact the, the very first video that i ever edited was for uh an, a suspension company iback suspension uh when they asked me because i had done some like little like i had this little tiny camera it's called a flip minnow and it would it looked like a mobile phone but it had a little tiny screen on the front and then on the back it just had one camera in the center and you held it like upright and it was just a little 720p like hd camera 
And so I would use this to film photo shoots and stuff. And then I would, I think I used to edit it in like Windows Movie Maker or something. It was complete garbage, but it was fun, right? I mean, at the end of the day, videos don't have to be all fancy to be good. Um, and so I'd done some of those for a shoot that I'd done for them in Germany. And they saw it and they were like, well, look, we would like some product videos doing. Would you be interested in doing that? I was like, hell yeah, of course. And so I quoted them for it. And it was out in California. And it was actually the very first time that I ever came to California. Uh, and it was in Corona, of all places, uh, which is, uh, no offense to everybody from Corona, but the arse end of nowhere. Um, and I remember coming out and it was basically my opportunity to get to California for free. I had no idea how to properly edit. I had no idea how to properly shoot. I had no video equipment. But I was like, yeah, I can do that. No problem at all. And I actually found the invoice right for the shoot now this shoot and, and you know obviously michael what my day rate is but the the invoice that i got for this shoot or that i submitted for this shoot it was six videos i think something like that five or six videos each one about three minutes long so i know that you're probably totting that up in your head right now and when i looked at the invoice do you know what i charged them uh thousand dollars eight yeah about 850 pounds Wow. Plus plus travel, obviously, but yeah, £850 to do all of that, which, I mean, that may sound like a lot to, to some people. And, and to me, at the time, £850 was, obviously, I thought it was right, otherwise I wouldn't have submitted it. But when I look back now, I'm like, oh my God, I was editing that project for, no word of a lie, probably two months afterwards. Um, but yeah, I, I remember getting back to the Producer Michael channel. In the beginning, I hated the edits. And now, I actually really enjoy doing them. Like I, Because we've got our flow, and I know when we shoot, we shoot to edit. So it's like, it, it it's just an extension of the of the creative process of actually making the videos. And yeah. But you've, you've made it a lot more difficult for yourself by moving. Uh, Adam lives about, what, 65 miles away from me now. So that's a 130 mile round trip that uh, he has to do because I won't go out of Beverly Hills. <laughs> not without your passport. Yeah, it's <laughs> Well, I do venture true. out sometimes, not often, but sometimes. It's true. But the thing is, though, I mean, you know me, I don't mind driving. Like, I, I enjoy it. I don't necessarily enjoy sitting in traffic, but um, it you would just have to make it work, right? You just do, do a couple of house tours in a day or film a couple of videos, and it makes sense. And obviously, with me coming back up every Monday to get my blood done, like, it's there's always ways to work around it. And the the trade off like you've seen the videos that i've put out of my of my new place and the where i live now and the you know the beach that i'm able to take the dog to like it's it's so worth it you, it you, looks absolutely gorgeous i mean i i haven't been down there yet uh, but at some point i will definitely uh, get my passport ready i'll pack a suitcase <laughs> rent a car uh, all the supplies definitely rent a car <laughs> and uh and I'll head down your direction. No, for sure. You should come down and, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll go down the beach. And it's just, it's just beautiful. And, oh, my gosh, supercars. I, I honestly think that PCH, like right here outside my house, I think that there are more supercars go along PCH in an hour than go along Rodeo Drive in half a day. It's amazing. I, I can imagine some neighbors not liking it. But for me, I have my windows open. I sit out on my front deck and I just hear like, boom, Ferrari, boom, Lamborghini. And I'm like listening out. I'm like, that's a Hurricane, it's an Aventador, it's a McLaren. Like, you can't hear a McLaren. You can. They just sound They're like this. They're silent. <laughs> They're not silent, they, but they've got, they all sound the same. A Senna sounds like a loud 570. They all, they they all sound just sound like, the They sound like a lawnmower. I, I, you have to admit it's not the greatest sounding car i totally agree with you it is not the greatest sounding car in the world no but you can tell a mclaren you can tell yes. what mclaren sounds like um but yeah they it, that that engine that v8 it's a great engine like technologically speaking it's a great engine uh like the the 600 lt i want to drive the is it the 700 lt is that the fast 600 lt that you are out. totally asking the wrong person when it comes to McLaren. I want to love McLaren. I mm -hmm. really do. Uh, being British, yeah. um, it's a British car. I want to love it, but I uh, haven't got there yet. I, I, I do hear they are improving, and uh, I'm looking forward to the day when they improve enough where I'll consider one. Do you know how I think you would get the most enjoyment out of McLaren outside of setting one on fire? <laughs> Uh, does Lotus ring a bell? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely won't go there. <laughs> no. Uh, um, yeah, tell me. 
Um, I think if you were to buy a cheap high mileage uh, 570S, which you can pick up now for what eighty five, ninety thousand, something like that. Can you really that 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 well, inexpensive? Well, I know that Mike, uh, my buddy Mike, he had a really high mileage one, uh, like. I think he'd done 40 or 45,000 miles in that thing. Um, and it was only a couple of years old. And he got a hundred and about 115 or 120 for his, I think. Um, so I imagine now, now that they're another t- two years older than that. But yeah, you could probably get like a beat up high mileage one for under 100 grand. I'm sure wow. of it. But that's a lot of that's a lot of car for that amount of money. It really, right? Is. And and regardless of the build quality and all the rest of it, standing back and looking at a 570, it's a great looking car. Like you, you got to concede that it is a good looking car. I, I know, but uh, you know, my problem is um, I, I'm scared of them catching fire. A lot of them catch fire. Um, a lot of them break down. You can't open the engine compartment, which I think is the biggest mistake ever. And yeah. I still don't understand why you can't. And yeah, you know, the thing sets on fire. You can't even put it out. Yeah. To be fair, though, it's it's not. It's the centers that were set on fire, and that was through a manufacturing flaw. I like the the five seventies. As far as I'm aware, there's not any type of major issue with those setting on fire. Any difference? No, I, ag- I agree. I don't think the five seventies do. The seven twenties do, but the do uh, they? Oh, a lot of them. Yeah, a lot of them. Set on Just fire? Watch, watch Instagram. There's a lot of them. They burn nicely, actually. <laughs> do you, but do you think it's one of those things where, like, when you get a car, then you start noticing more of them on the road? Do you think it's like when someone posts one 720 on fire, then all of a sudden every 720 that sets on fire gets posted, whereas, like, I'm sure there's Lambos and, you know, Ferraris even that, that their exhaust gets too hot, melts the wire and loom, causes a short whatever... But Lambos, they, Lambos are a different story because a lot of people put these ridiculous, ridiculous exhausts on that, that shoot fire. Um, never understood why anybody would do that. It just makes no sense at all. Uh, and, and of course, those regularly catch on fire. Uh, the McLarens, if you look at any 720 uh, that's more than maybe three months old, look around the exhaust. All the paint has come off the bumpers that burns. There is no fix for it. It's just a bad design. And uh, if they get too hot, they catch fire. Just got to put a longer exhaust pipe on it. Yeah, I, I do uh, think, though, that, that if you were to get a cheap 570 and use it as a, a track, uh, like either a track car to take it out to the thermal club uh, or just to use it for, like, banging around the canyons. And I know that's not your cup of tea um, enough to, to warrant getting a car specifically for it. But I think if somebody lent you one for the weekend and was like i don't care about this car like drive it drive it like it's meant to be driven i think you would probably have a a new respect just for the way that that it was to drive of course you wouldn't be happy with the fit and finish and and that's that's a given but i think in terms of it being a driving machine i think you would you would have more fun with it because on track they are really nice really nice to drive joking apart I've driven many, many McLarens, uh, 720s, 650s. I've driven the same. I've driven them all. And they do drive very well. The 728, uh, 728, 720s is blisteringly fast. I mean, it's it's really, really fast. Um, it's a good position where you're driving in. It's just the stuff inside the car that, and, and the way, as you say, the fit and finish is awful. And I just can't. I can't get myself to to enjoy it because I'm, you know me. I'm like you. I'm a, I'm a bit OCD with stuff, and um, Adam doesn't like things that don't fit properly. I don't like things that don't fit properly. Uh, I don't like having to go through five different screens yeah. to change the air conditioning and stuff. That's like that. weird. That infotainment system where you have to like, yeah, get out of the radio to change to turn your AC down. That that yeah. just should have been a knob terrible it's absolutely terrible so you know uh, i'm not saying it's a bad car i'm just saying it's not a car for me uh, i'm a ferrari guy as you know um the the fit and finish is unbelievable the performance is is unbelievable um just a great car and and i think you know it's going to take a lot to change me how many ferraris have you owned oh my goodness a lot i, I have no idea what what no was your idea. first your very first ferrari um, uh, my first Ferrari was a 308 GTSI, which was the injection uh, car, um, and I had a lot of fun. That was like the Magnum PI car. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah. But, uh, fun car, red with cream interior. Uh, one of the funnest cars I- I've ever had. Not particularly fast. Well, 
back then it was fast, but in today's world, uh, not that fast. Um, but a lot of fun and, uh, hey, it's a Ferrari. And then what did you get after that? Have you, have you had multiple Ferraris at any point? I had a massive collection of Ferraris at one point, and uh, as the market started to go down this many years ago, I got rid of them all like an idiot, thinking that they would be worthless. Uh, had I have kept them, uh, oh my goodness, they've gone up a thousand percent or more. That sucks. What did you have when you were at the peak of I, your collection? I had everything. I had all the good ones. All the good ones. <laughs> all, and, all the good ones. You sound yeah. like you're collecting Pokemon cards. I had them all. Yeah, they were pretty much. I, 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 I just had a, a lot of Ferraris and uh, who were my pride and joy. And then the market literally collapsed. And why, why am I paying all the insurance on this and just watching them de- go down and, and you know, become basically worthless? Uh, you couldn't give them away. And I struggled to sell them. Uh, but uh, now you look at them and say, oh, my goodness me. So was Crazy. that was that here or was that uh, East Coast? That was East Coast. East right, Coast. got you. And haven't you, you've got a, a Diablo, haven't you, out in, is it still in Spain? It is. Yeah. You should try and bring that over. I know there's. I know it's difficult, but you should try and get that over. That would be a fun car. It's a great car. It's, a, it's called a Momo edition, mm-hmm. and it's a, a very rare one. It's a combination of orange and red, uh, and it drips oil. Uh, there's nothing can be done to stop it dripping oil. I've had 50 attempts at it, changed every gasket a thousand times, and uh, there's nothing you can do to stop it dripping oil. Well, at least you know there's oil still inside it. I mean, what, what airplane was it that used to drip fuel? Was it Concorde? Because of one, once it got to speed, everything expanded and then everything fit right. But when it was on the ground, everything shrunk back, and so it used to, used to drip uh, fuel. That's exactly right. And uh, a little bit of trivia for you, the Concorde would actually expand in length during flight. Mm. And there were two sections within the fuselage of the plane with expanders in them. And you could watch them expand in flight. I flew the Concorde twice. Amazing airplane. That's that's terrifying. Yeah, I, my, my buddy Tom, who in fact, I'm going to get on the podcast. He's an aircraft engineer. And uh, he was telling me all kinds of facts. He, I remember when he told me that they were having issues with the nose cone overheating. Um, and so he's like, how do you think that they cooled that down? And I was like, I don't know. Like, obviously they couldn't fly slower cause they were trying to get to the, the speed of sound. So uh, he was like, yeah, so they couldn't fly slower. So what do you think they did? And I was like, water cooling, like, is that a thing? Could they, could they pump water around? He's like, but what's cooler than water? And I was like, I don't know. And he said, fuel, they literally used fuel in the skin of the aircraft to cool it down because the, the jet fuel was cooler than water. And I was like, wait, so they've got this molten hot nose cone that they're trying to cool down and they do it by firing the most combustible liquid known to man around it to try and dissipate the heat. And he's like, yep, that's why Concorde doesn't fly much. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. I, I didn't know that's interesting. Here's another bit of trivia for you about Concorde. Did you know that in flight, in level flight, that the uh, cockpit has no windows at all? In level flight has no windows. So uh, when the aircraft is taking off and landing, the yeah. nose dips yeah. 26 degrees. Mm-hmm. And when it gets to level flight, the nose goes up. And that's a heat shield that goes over the glass. So everything is done by instrument. There's no, no visual. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, because I know obviously when you see it land and the nose, the, the aircraft's like this and the nose is sort of pointed that way. And I, I know that I've seen the, the little cutouts where, where you can then see. That is what a, an amazing, amazing aircraft. Such a shame that that, that thing didn't pick up. And, and I guess realistically, you know, when you've got stuff like this where we can do Zoom calls, why do you need to get to New York in five hours or three? No, it wasn't like three and a half hours or something, London to New York. There's another reason why Concorde wasn't able to fly over the United States, uh, and that's because of uh, two reasons. Um, One was the sound Mm -hmm. barrier. When you fly faster than the speed of sound, it creates a sonic boom, and that sonic boom is so loud it would shatter windows. So (laughs) if you're flying at uh, 40,000 feet, um, the the houses below you would be uh, (laughs) rattling. And the other problem was um, back in the day when Concorde flew, it would actually fly between 50 and 55,000 feet on average. It could go up to a ceiling of 65, I believe. I might be wrong. Um, and the air, con- tra- air traffic control monitoring in the U.S. didn't go to that ceiling. So it was flying in unmonitored airspace, and that was uh, you know, a very uh, 
not good thing to do. Interesting. Yeah, no, I, I didn't know that. Do, do you know a, a very sad, w- very weird, and I didn't realize at the time, but sad story is I actually saw that Concorde going down in France. No way. So no I was way. on I was on a school trip headed to uh, Disneyland Paris, and we were on the motorway, and we saw this aeroplane come across and it was it looked like a jet fighter like as in that that's the because we weren't really paying attention but that was the memory that i have is like this kind of like jet plane coming across and there being like smoke and fire and so in my however old i was at the time i was a young kid young kid's mind i was like oh it's just a fighter jet or something and then we got stuck in this crazy long traffic jam that no joke i think we're in this traffic jam for like five or six hours uh, and it wasn't until we got back that we realized that that's what it was and that was the the concord coming down that's amazing that's, yeah uh, yeah amazing not, not a good sight to see but no no but yeah, yeah. Ab- absolutely incredible and what uh what tom said as well about those aircraft is that apparently once they so to to get to the speed of sound they needed something like 195 percent 100 percent throttle or whatever once they had reached the speed of sound they backed the throttles off to like 20 percent that's right yeah because you you reach your maximum glide altitude once you sustain that the, the plane should stay at that because you're so high the air the higher you go the thinner the air yeah i mean just absolutely incredible incredible and yeah very, very sad that it's not working what do you think of uh like all the spacex stuff and sending human beings into space would, would you go to mars no um i wouldn't <laughs> too far outside uh, of beverly hills I, I think it's the biggest waste of money i don't understand why i just don't get it um i don't see man ever living on mars or in a space capsule and i think a lot more things could be done with that money to help people rather than just blow it in fuel and going into the atmosphere but I, hey i guess there's another agenda that maybe i don't know about yeah I, I mean elon musk he said that he wants to die on mars like his his goal is to be on mars maybe not in the first lot of people that go there obviously but because they've said that once once you get there you're not right now you're not coming back like the the first people who apparently they've already had people sign up and the first ones i don't i don't, I don't think there's any fuel stations up on mars yet i don't so, believe so, so no no yeah, but they but they he was talking about them being able to uh potentially make fuel up there based on something in the atmosphere or i don't know hydrogen or something I, it's way above my pay grade but yeah, they were going to harness uh rays from the sun to power solar cells uh, who, who knows right got you yeah i mean yeah in, absolutely incredible I, I i get where you're coming from with with regards to could you spend that money better elsewhere yeah but i guess that's that's human evolution or, or that's civilization's evolution isn't it is that if there weren't these outliers like elon musk doing the things that he's doing then we wouldn't make the progress because we can make this very slow progress so you can have somebody like him who just tries to leapfrog all of it and go let's go to fucking mars and then you know that's it we're all of a sudden if we don't get to mars we do have rockets that can be reused and that helps us in other ways and yeah i, I think i think he's a, an incredible man like I, I have no idea what planet he's actually from because it certainly ain't here maybe he's from mars and he wants to go home ever thought about that it would make sense i mean <laughs> have you have you heard about him thinking that we potentially live in a simulation um no so <laughs> there is a there are two podcasts that i want you to go listen to maybe do it while you while you're on your treadmill or something pop them in pop your podcast in your ears um joe rogan podcast with um elon musk number one and then listen to number two he is such a fascinating guy and actually listening to the podcast especially the first one is kind of weird because every time joe asks him a question elon will be like so joe asking something and elon will go and there's this super long pause and when you're listening to it and you don't see him doing it it's so odd because it's like wait is it broken like is my hello like is my headphones broken and then he'll answer and he's just got such a strange mannerism but i just i I can't even imagine what's going on in his brain like or how quickly his thoughts work because yeah the the stuff that he has going on and the stuff that he's achieved already is amazing you know what i mean like just such a amazing human 
you 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 like just lost the connection. Oh, did I? Can you? Oh, there you are. There you are. You you came back. You disappeared for a, a microsecond. Oh, okay. Well, hello. Here I am. Um, talking of uh, Tesla, Tesla Roadster. What do you think? I think it's very fast. Uh, it's definitely not a Michael car. So he was talking. Elon Musk was talking about a way that they can improve the zero to 60 time which i believe is already under two seconds and do you know what he's talking about doing mm, Us- using compressed air so literally like a little jet out the back using compressed air to accelerate it i think he's mentioned that in the i think it was in the first joe rogan podcast and then they touched on it in the second one but he was a little bit more like cagey about it the second time around but yeah he was on need, about- you would need a lot of compressed air a lot a lot to produce enough thrust yeah and if that was possible i wouldn't want to be the car behind it <laughs> right can you imagine you're at a traffic light no. and you blow the front bumper off someone's beetle behind you and <laughs> <laughs> take the paint off your car <laughs> That's Imagine insane. if you're on a motorbike, blow your underpants down. It'd be like you on your surfboard. Yeah, right. That's funny. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Well, look, mate. I mean, this has been uh, probably like an hour and a half. So I know it that- has been. It has been. Um, it has been. Oh, oh, is that is that near- a little is that a little plug there for Panzera? Yeah, I, you know, I, I wore this for the first time today. That looks um, good on ma- you. Ma- matches my uh, matches my shirt. There I am. See, matches my shirt. What a, an amazing watch for very reasonable, inexpensive. It, it, it looks so much more expensive than it is. It's just a beautiful watch. And uh, to Panzera, thank you, because this was a gift. Adam gave it to me a couple of days ago um, from Panzera. What's, what's the, the gentleman's name? Uh, Roger. Roger Cooper. Roger. He, he's the, the owner of, of Panzera. Yeah, he's awesome. He's, he's so, so, Roger, good. if you if you're watching this, thank you very, very, very much. Um, I absolutely love it, and I appreciate it. And uh, if anyone's looking to get a nice, don't don't we have a code? We to, do. Yeah. What, yeah. what is? It? If if people want to get ten percent off, then uh, you use code. Well, there's two. So there's my code, which is just swords, and then there's uh, PM ten, as in producer Michael ten, and both of them will get you ten percent off the watch, including sale price. So if the watches are on sale, then you'll also get ten percent off the sale price, which is awesome. So no, just real, real solid guys. In fact, I this wasn't planned, but I have mine here. My this is old faithful. So I have battered this thing, and it's still running fine. So, oh, and you were asking me about changing the straps. Um, you just gotta push the push this across, and then in there you've got the little metal thing, and just slide it across, and you can change the. I don't. I don't, th- I don't think I have that. Let me see. Yeah. There you go. So you just slide slide the strap across, and then underneath that, you'll have the the quick release metal doodad. Well, I'll, I'll tell you off camera. Yeah, tell me off camera. Anyway, well, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, while I've got it off my wrist, is that in focus? Probably not. Not, not yet. No. Why? Why? Keep it's, talking. Get the camera. I'm talking. Back. Do I move it? Do I hold it still? Uh, I don't know, honestly. I'm not sure. Oh well. Anyway. Uh, you can go you on the buy website. one, then you'll, it'll be in focus for you all the time. <laughs> there you go. Panzera.shop is the uh, the address for that. Uh, and they are not actually the sponsor of this podcast. Um, but there you go. I really like this stuff, and Michael does now too, which is very cool. Um, That's really cool. Yeah, this was fun, mate. We should, we should yeah, do this again. Yeah, a lot of fun. Um, Let's do it again. Let's do it again. I, and, I mean, there's uh, so much stuff to, to talk about that we didn't cover, but uh, at least that gives people a, a little idea of your background because i think that there's a lot of questions about that a lot of people only know you from the producer michael channel and so they come on and they're like what like who is this guy like what 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 does he do and so there you go now you know that's what michael does or that's the things that michael's done well thank you for having me as a guest i really (laughs) appreciate it and uh i probably won't watch this back it's like two hours long it is (laughs) The good thing is, you, you know what you said, so uh, so you don't have to watch it back. I That's the beauty of these, is to edit them. It's great. I just put a title on the beginning, a title on the end, and that's it. We're done. Export to YouTube and to, to the uh, old podcast. Into am, I allowed, am I allowed to throw a plug in for the Producer Michael channel? A thousand percent. I'd, I'd be disappointed hit, if you didn't. Hit the subscribe button, please. Hit the subscribe button, hit the likes, and uh, hit the bell, and uh, we'll continue to make content, which we hope you like.
Thank you. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So yeah, everything will be linked down below, guys. Obviously, you're here watching this on my channel or listening to it through the podcast. So for that, thank you very much. I appreciate you. Um, but yeah, we are. I will link everything in the description. Um, so if you want to check out the producer Michael channel, if you haven't already, which I'm almost certain that you already are subscribed to that. I hope you are. Um, we have a good time. That's a luxury lifestyle channel. So Michael shows you the lifestyles of the rich and famous million well i was just about to say million dollar diamonds but as as awful as it sounds that isn't even close to being the most exciting thing on the channel is it no uh no we we, we just want to you know inspire you let you know that you can do i washed dishes dishes for a long time for the british army uh, and and now i have this view out in my, my window and you can do it too so we're in it to win it hundred percent hundred percent so uh yeah well thank you michael appreciate you mate um no doubt you'll call me again this afternoon so i'll talk to you in a bit um and, <laughs> no uh, doubt <laughs> and for you guys at home listening to this thank you so much for the support i really appreciate you guys supporting these uh, new endeavors of mine the podcast uh if you're into gaming then you can check me out on twitch i stream semi-regularly and badly because i'm not very good at the game that i play um and then yeah obviously this podcast and then oh the last thing that i want to plug is the discord channel so if you want to join our discord channel it's basically like a little chat room uh and we have lots of different topics in there so we have uh cars we have games we have tech we have photography we have watches like all kinds of stuff great little community in there of people that are getting along nicely and uh, yeah come join it be a good human being let people uh, know who you are and make some new friends so yeah until next time guys enjoy yourselves be safe hit the subscribe button do all the good things uh we actually have a memorial day sale right now for swords merch so if you want to go and grab yourself something you can 20 percent off use code memorial 20 all right that's it anything else to say michael cheerio <laughs> see you guys bye bye bye